Well, hello, everybody. We are live. There's Dr. Cannabis, her moderator. We have some people rolling in shortly, um, which is always exciting. We'll have the usual crew coming to join us today, as always. And I got to say, I am having a lot of fun right now because I happen to have the unique opportunity to uh, enjoy something that's that's before it's released. And Dr. Anibus, I'd love to, to give you a moment of your time since you're the first one in here and we might as well keep the get the conversation rolling while we're waiting on everybody else to join us is what, you know, are you working on? Because there's something pretty cool coming out pretty soon that I think people should get excited about. Yeah, so for the last, oh, I don't know, well, it's been going on for a while, but for definitely for the last three months, I've been really working really hard on creating an education series um, that will be available for people to sign up for and take. Um, there will be like packages of like, um, what do I want to say, like like classes that are, are, are related to each other, or you can just take a single class for something that you're specifically interested in and it will be focused on just a single topic. Um, so yeah, I it, and it's going to be a series that will be continually added to. So like the Jane Cower, where we every week we have something new that we talk about. Um, I want to keep building on this education series, and people can tell me, you know, where they feel like, you know, what's something that they want to learn that isn't out there, or you know, whatever the case may be. So it's kind of going to hopefully grow and continue to. Um, you know, I'll continue to add experts to help teach the courses and such. So that's been really fun, and I'm really excited. It should be out really soon. That's what I've been working on. Nice. I and you know, it's it it's it's a hell of a course. It's really well done. I've been I've been enjoying it thus far. Um, I'm excited <laughs> yeah, and, to do uh, it. When it when it does finally launch, um, it will be accessible through my website. So anishwabi.com, super easy to find. Right at the top, it'll say cannabis education series. You can just click on that. And it'll take you right to the courses. Um, it's not ready yet, but it will be uh, hopefully. Hopefully, I'm hoping by the end of this week. And this is this is awesome. I have my own at home grow course that you all can check out on Dagadot Academy. But this is done by PhD doctors and and really high level. Um, and I think it's 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 super well presented. So definitely go check that out. Well, we have our day beginning, and we have the you know a good portion of at least our usual group. A usual group of suspects here to join the conversation. So we'll get today rolling uh, without any further ado. I am excited for part two of the Dank Hour panel, where we will be discussing breeding with the breeders of the Dank. What, we're gonna, what this series is, is we're essentially doing um, a, a breeding project side by side with you, our guests, and with some of the best breeders that I know in the world. Um, I'm excited to have Mr. Trees join us today, and we'll learn all about you in a moment, Mr. Trees. But you can tune in each week to see the various amount of topics here on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. on Clubhouse and see all of the awesome stuff that's going on here, or you can catch us on Future Cannabis Project. The idea being is that we want to create a space where we get you know, people that are on the ground, you know, doing breeding with like our, like, like Mr. Trees here to the doctors. We want to get these conversations to be had together and, and, and talk about how we can move and express and grow together in this amazing world. And as usual, I'm London, your master of moderation for the evening, your dictator of discussion, and your all around weirdo that really likes alliteration um, to create a conversation and really have a dank hour of chat. The idea is that you get to sit down and join us and have this conversation. So without any further ado, we like to do this every single episode because it helps us do a little bit of a micro microphone check to see, to make sure everybody's coming through nice and loud and clear, as well as get you an opportunity to learn about a little bit about each one of our experts on the panel today. So we're going to go PTR order. For those that don't know, uh, PTR is in the order that you see them on screen on the clubhouse. So London, that's me, and Dr. Animus, Ashley, Johnny Gillian, and Mr. Treats. It's awesome that it's in this order today. Because you're our special guest, Mr. Tree, so we'd like to finish on you. So Johnny will be like, hey, I'm done. And then you go ahead and tell us all about yourself and kind of a little bit of your history, too, there. So without any further ado, get going, Dr. Anibis. Who the f*** are you? <laughs> <laughs> LOL. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Dr. Anibis. Um, I am, what am I? Uh, I guess I'm a cannabis scientist, researcher, geneticist, um, and educator. I am in New Jersey currently working with an outfit that is growing um, organic hemp at the moment using aquaponic methods. 
Um, I completed my PhD in, when was that, 2019, I think? Yeah, that sounds right. 2019, looking at, well, it was entitled a uh, multi, multi-faceted approach to addressing uh, variation in cannabis sativa. So I actually do have a PhD in cannabis, which is kind of nice. And um, I enjoy my life every day. I love discussing cannabis. I'm so excited to hear some more stuff about breeding. And um, Ashley, you're up next. Maybe on mute, just so you know. Oh, man. Ooh, seems to be coming through a little bit funky. Uh, we do have another yes, that will be popping in. There is our Peter. So, Ashley, is it coming through, or am I the only one getting screwed up here? Is, or do you want to try again and say hello? I hear you. I hear you too. I hear. And uh, Black Blackbird will be on in uh, like fifteen I don't, minutes. I don't hear Ashley at all. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I hear all of us, but I don't hear Ashley quite yet. Do, are you there, Ashley? Maybe we'll skip by. Oh, there you go. There you go. Fighting my Wi-Fi right now. Fighting my. Okay. No problem, Ashley. We'll go to go ahead and say hello to uh, Johnny while we, you figure out your Wi-Fi situation. But go ahead and say hello to there, Johnny. Hello, everybody. My name is Johnny Gilligan. Um, I'm a cannabis cultivator and enthusiast all around. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, to be sitting in. It's been a few weeks since I've been able to sit down and enjoying all of you, but I'm happy to be back and uh, looking forward to this talk. Um, Ashley, I'm not sure if if you are back in, in proper service, but, um, you know, I guess I'll give you a shot here. Or how about this? Ashley, you shoot me a message on the back when you're all good to go, and then we'll make sure to not call on you until that point in time. She's left the room, people. She's left the room, <laughs> which is fine. Right, she's Mr. gone. Dude. Mr. Trees, come on, come on, uh, say hello and introduce yourself to everybody because it's it's important. You're our feature guest for the evening, um, and I'm excited to get to know a little bit of you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me good? Am I coming Brilliant. Through? You sound amazing. All right. That's what I like to hear. Good deal. Good deal. I was just uh, shoveling some uh, truckload full of wor or, uh, mushroom compost out of the back of my truck, and I'm like, holy cow, it's... It's five o'clock. We got to go. So I'm a little sweaty, but I'm smoking a bowl. I've got some Pam F3 stuff I'm going through and smoking on right now, which is nice. And I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, you know, kind of hear some questions and uh, bounce some stuff off of you guys. And yeah, it's it's my pleasure to be here and hang out. So that's what I plan on doing. I got I got a free couple hours from the wife and kids and this is what I'm doing. So 100% in. Awesome. I love it. Love it. Peter, did you have a minute to say hello as well? Did you want to say hello to everybody in the wacky world of Clubhouse? And <laughs> I, uh, I just went outside to smoke a joint, but uh, yes, I'm trying to find reception. Hold on. Uh, I hear myself again. Uh, <laughs> I just got a whole bunch of seeds from Shooter, and he sent a joint as well. That That's that's an awesome bonus when you get it back. Yes, it was in the uh, the jar of seeds had a a joint ready to go. So I felt, figured I should smoke it immediately. Some Panama Red crossed with God Bud. Well, that sounds absolutely delicious, and I hope everybody's ready for a fun one today. Uh, and we are going to be talking about, uh, if I go to the top, we are going to be talking about plant selection and getting jiggy with it. And and let's like, how do you, how the hell do you, do you a select the plant that you're going to pull pollen from, and b um, decide whether or not you which plant to do it, and then how to do it without 
destroying potentially or not destroying because i don't think when you when you pollinate something you've destroyed it but uh potentially affecting the rest of your space you know it, it'd be great to be able to grow some beans for your at-home breeder and that's the idea is we want everybody to kind of take this hobby on to themselves and enjoy it and grow along with us i have um on our last episode we selected and 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 we talked about selecting seeds, selecting breeders, trying to find where we were going to have our base start point off of. Um, and I actually think, there, Mr. Trees, you have a really great story. And we're, we're of course, going to lean on you a hell of a lot because you are one of our special guests. The other one will be showing up shortly. Is what we're like? You have kind of a Pam 15 that you mentioned there, which is which is the, the line that you have that you've been breeding off a long time. Do you want to talk a little bit about that one? And, and how you've been working it over the years and, and why you have such pride in that. All right. Um, so I'm Mr. Trees. I've been Mr. Trees for as long as I can remember. Uh, been growing fruit trees and gardens of cannabis for more than coming up on 25 years for cannabis. Since he was a baby. Yeah, literally, literally. Um, yeah, something that I do, something I do all the time. So I, I had a, I had some old bag seed from my youth. I needed some ganja, and I popped a few seeds, and I pulled out a, a plant that I really liked. And uh, long story short, there was a couple seeds in there. I planted those seeds, and selected a really nice plant that I, that my wife named uh, Pam after Pam Anderson because it was one of the prettiest funkiest plants in the garden and it came from you know the late 90s early 2000s era when you know Baywatch was at its at its prime time you know um so I grew that for a few years loved it a lot of people around me loved it it's just easy plant to grow easy plant to clone really pretty really kind of unique and unusual um nothing like out like Holy cow, this is the, the best weed on the on the planet Earth, but it's it definitely holds up. Um, and I, I sent a, a snip of it off to Phylos when Phylos was the hot thing. And um, back when Kevin Jodry and everybody was mapping mapping different different genetics. So I, I figured, hey, I don't really know what this is. It was kind of bag seed. Maybe if I can get some sort of answer, um, you know, on its uh, on its real, you know, origin then I could better breed the line um, and mess with it and combine partners and different things like that. So I sent it off and it kind of came back with no, you know, no data that was usable really for me. It, it, it sat in its own bubble in its own galaxy and didn't have any close, closely related relatives that, that, that was in their genetic database. So it kind of tested outside the realm. It kind of, kind of sat outside the, the box a little bit and kind of told me that hey this might be a little bit unique so um from that point forward i just kind of started you know hitting things with it trying to improve it and make it make it a little bit more you know gassy and you know up front and more uh you know more modern looking because it's definitely a raw sativa dominant kind of land racy type you know strain um and over the years playing with it and breeding it and talking with different people and different people around the world, you know, it's some sort of, uh, probably some sort of like Himalayan, you know, high elevation Himalayan ganja uh, is what it looks like you know, and kind of resembles all the characteristics of. Um, so yeah, I've been, like I said, I, I've, I've been playing with that for a long, long time and um, it's coming up on what, eight years with the Pam one clone and, uh, like six years with the Pam 15 clone and, you know, every type of back cross and out cross and, um, you know, thing that I can do with it. I've done with it. I pretty much, you know, I, I, I keep it around because it, it was, you know, it was kind of a outside the box until I can get more confirmed data on, on what it is or, you know, if it really is, you know, kind of out of the box and that special and, but I enjoy smoking it. Everybody enjoys smoking it. it. It's an excellent breeding plant. It's something that is pretty darn dominant in all of the characteristics that, you know, it, it passes on. And if you're trying to change something with it, you better have something that is, that is a worked line or um, has a lot of domination care, you know, capabilities because 
the Pam always shows you, you know, where she is and all the crosses. And that's what I kind of use it for is my, it's my calibration tool. So anything that I like or that I want to work with or any males that I find or females that I reverse, I always hit them to Pam's, you know, one and 15, because it tells me exactly what that plant will, will, you know, more than likely pass on, you know, in a strong fashion. So it's a great calibration tool on learning, you know, what other things do and, and how, uh, you know, how it all fits together. So. Awesome. Well, we're going to play this a little bit loosey goosey here today because I'm going to invite people to come up and ask some questions. So if you do have a question, don't be afraid to raise your hand because we will do a little bit more question and answering, but we want to keep our, our, our conversation focused on the breed. So one thing that I want to get into and, and, and really ask you about, because you mentioned that you're selecting plants and, and putting them into, um, into your breeding products that you're currently working. So into your PAM, how do you go about selecting plants like males, um, specifically, let's let's start with regular um, re using regular pollen from diploid plants, so not feminized plant. Well, I mean, they're all diploid, but non-feminized plants. So, how do you go about selecting a male plant to use in your program, and and whether it be large scale or small scale, what is your recommended methodology of doing that? And I know everybody's going to have a different kind of lineup and setup. I don't expect there to be ever, ever any consistency at all. Everybody has their own passions. But for your general goals and purpose, purposes, which might be important to lay out too, like what are your general goals and purposes for your breeding? And then how does that affect your choice of selecting a male that you might bring into a breeding program? So, um, you know, like the, the general answer would be, you know, depending on each project de determines what your male or who your donor is going to be. Um, so in certain cases, like like a preservation project, you know, or you're trying to preserve a line, you know, one of the, like the Kandahar for example that we're working on right now, the Kandahar mark red. Um, I, you know, wanted to do an open pollination and use all the plants that I had because I had, you know, I had, you know, 20 seeds or something like that uh, or less to to work with on a population so i used all the plants in there to kind of capture as much of the of the you know of the palette as possible so um it didn't really matter if if the male was short or tall or stinky or or anything in the original just to preservation purposes and then that next generation you'll have plenty of seed to kind of go through and then make your make your selections on the outliers and things like that so you can kind of up your numbers. Um, if I'm looking for, I used to use like a single male a lot of the time. Um, I think everybody does or did, or most people still do. Um, you kind of select one male and you think that this is the stud and you cross it to your plant and that, that works out for a while. But I always find that using a couple males um, really gives me I don't know, more, more, I don't know, it, it's hard, it, it's like more, more durable, more complex, more predictable seed uh, in the long term whenever I use, you know, like a multiple male project that try to pick a couple of good males instead of just using one good male. Uh, there was a time when I used just, I was doing, doing some stuff and I, I selected this one male and I used it on everything and almost everything that I crossed it to got this weird tropical type, you know, smell to it that I didn't like. And it, it, it was just, it just came directly from that mail and it kind of ruined the entire project for me because everything you have to look through a lot of plants to find the, the smell that wasn't the, the smell that I didn't like. So ever since then I started using a couple males. So whenever I looked at the plants after that through the seed, I would have, you know, I'd, I'd have an easier time finding what I was looking for, you know, in a, in a weird way. So, um, if I'm going to use just one male, which I have in the past and I do, and I, I have a couple that I keep around here and there, uh, it's gotta be, it's usually those resin males, uh, the males that show resin early, easily, you can sometimes prune back a male late, you know, when it's late in flower, 
you can prune them back and sometimes they'll throw resin but the ones that show resin without any kind of abuse i like i like seeing those i like seeing some special uh color or resin development that's abnormal to the others and then i'll pull that one aside and use him solely and figure out exactly kind of what what he does you know and then that goes back to, to crossing it to pam and figuring out what he does you know um but i like i like resin males anytime i find a resin male some a male that, that, that expresses resin or extreme smell or something that is just just outright stand out above the rest and the rest being a lot you know as many as you can see um that's that's the male that i'll that i'll keep solely but most of the time i'm, I'm picking a couple of really good males uh that are quality that don't don't have hard time growing that don't get picked on as much that just are a, a, a beautiful plant that has a good flower structure and smell is really important to me so they they got a stink in some way I like a stinky veg plant, whether that translates to flower or not. That's a, another topic we can talk about later or whatever for another day. But I like a stinky plant. So I'm, I'm always looking for, for some sort of a plant that smells a little bit above average uh, for that group of males. But it just depends. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I wanted to ask, because I think, I think you touched on a really interesting point here is using multiple males pollen. And, and when you come to, when you start inbreeding lines heavily, you, you create, a, you can create a challenge for yourself long-term and by having multiple pollen donors at the start, I think it's, an, it, it, it's a really helpful fact. So Dr. Anibis, what would, I, I have a two part question for you and I'll word it slowly. So you have plenty of time to prepare. The first part being is what, when it comes to the genetic diversity of of what we're doing here, when it when using multiple male plants, what are we? What's the outcome? What what's what are we creating more genetic diversity, less genetic diversity, and how? And secondly, how does that affect the the breeding later on when it comes to things? When it comes to the development, and speed, and growth of the plant. London. Okay, so when you, so uh, this always like gets my brain just into overdrive um, because with males, you, because they don't have, you know, the female flower, they don't show you the same potential for phenotypes or chemotypes that a female can show you when she's in flower. So I feel like working with males unless you have you know unless you've read it before and or you and you know where it's come from comes from like you just you don't know what that male has to offer so it's kind of at the beginning it, it could potentially be a crash shoot as uh, mr trees was saying um you know he bred one of his males and it gave all of the theme you know all of the offspring this funky tropical um profile that he wasn't super hip on um, you know, but you can find a stud that always gives the, uh, what do I want to say? That always, um, or that very often gives the, the next generation kind of like a, a consist, more consistent um, phenotype in its offspring. So I don't know that you're creating more genetic diversity when you're, when you're, when you're feminizing um you know creating female pollen all you have to work with is what that female has in her toolbox her genetic toolbox when you have a male and a female now you've got twice as much stuff in the genetic toolbox that you're you're pulling from into the next generation so it's it's not that you're creating more diversity you just have more to work with from the get-go but if you're you know i mean if you if you're solid in what you're trying to create then using the, the feminization procedure, you're kind of cutting down on surprises, <laughs> I feel like. I don't know. Um, and in terms of, if, uh, is it better to work with males than females? I, I don't think it's better or worse. It just depends on your situation, what you're going for, what you're looking for. <clears throat> um, you know, by feminizing, you know what you've got and, and you have less 
a smaller toolbox from things that you're going to get in terms of what your offspring are going to turn out like because you've only got you know one parent that's contributing to the the genotype of the next generation whereas when you're doing a full cross with a female and a male you've got two genotypes that are mixing um, so you're going to get a mixture of both of those parents did that answer your question awesome okay. Flawless answer. We appreciate it. We're going to get into the other question too. So, but I, we're going to get into, we're going to talk about choosing whether to do feminized pollen or do to, to, to use male or, or deciding that right, right nextly. But okay. So we've spent our time. We've, we've, we've watched our previous episode and we made sure to make the right decision on selecting um, beans or, or seeds that we, that we have vetted and ensured are either, at least uh, we have an understanding of what's going on. Um, we've then taken those plants and grown them right up. Say we've selected one, say we, we've selected a dozen males. I know people that have, that have done or been a part of um, large hunts of, through male plant, through 10,000 male plant, do, through 10,000 plants to find one stud male. And so I've, I've averted this before. So say we find our stud male plant. We find our one male plant that we're going to want to, you know, keep with us and, and breed with for a while. Now, my question is, is how do you go about, like, keeping these male plants? Do you keep the genetic material stored in seed through further generational breeding? Or are you able to take these plants, bring them, you know, make sure that they're not dropping pollen all the time, but but keep them in a vegetative state and then use clones to produce a consistent pollen, uh, cons to have an un almost unlimited supply of, of consistent pollen from an individual's, um, individual's plant. You know what I mean? Like, so what's, what's your methodology? Like a father, like a father plant. Like we have mother yeah. plants, like like a father. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Because yeah, I've always yeah. wondered, because they like, because it seems like they almost drop pollen on the regular with like pre flower. I, my guess would be that they drop pollen on the regular with pre flowers, um, just like female plants develop pre flowers as well. So I mean, as as a home breeder, one one flower drop can be a big challenge in pollinatable plants. So my question is like, what do you do, and what's the methodology and thought process behind? It? All right, so <clears throat> you like you don't know what, what you're getting with a male a lot of the time. So if, if it, if it's a male that's going to be kept around, it better be darn special. And I've spent money and had, had different males tested at a young age, have the, have the leaf tissue tested for different cannabinoid profiles and things like that. And one of the males that I do keep is a flamingo Ringo male. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of my CBD type lines and I was looking for CBD. You can't really, you know, you need to test when you're doing CBD work or any other cannabinoid work that doesn't, you know, it's not psychoactive. So uh, I tested quite a few plants. I found this one male that, that had a little bit, you know, the, the, the right ratios that I, that I like, I can post up uh, the test results on my Instagram after this, if you guys, you know, want to see some of that stuff, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's something that I know has this much CBD. It's just a couple percent, you know, in a male, young leaf tissue you know sample so it's like nothing like measurable but like on a on a ratio scale there's there's been males test up to seven percent cbd um this one i think is like four or three and a half or something like that um but comparison to all of its siblings were you know in the one percent or half a percent at a young veg state you know that 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 one was the highest one of the group um he's got a lot of good characteristics as well other than that but that's a that's a way to like determine whether it's a keeper male um but as far as dropping pollen and pre-flower and all those other things you know some males keep better than others you know over time uh, i i find that uh if you if you have to re-veg a male you find a male you like them you want to re-veg them that one always kind of you run the risk of you know developing little pre-flowers and and dropping stuff more often so than taken a plant that is in veg state that hasn't shown sex yet took in clones of that plant kept that in veg the entire time flowered out the 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 male you know the it's it's dad found out it was a male made it through all the selection process and then you have that clone already in, in you know in veg state mother status so to speak or father status uh, and doesn't have any problems you can keep that for years i've had multiple plants that you know i've let go after not needing them after a while but they never it never was let go because they always dropped pollen they were totally fine just like any other female plant um no issues whatsoever uh, keeping it just just like an old female so 
Um, I imagine that you can, you know, depending on the plant, the time that you take it, that might have some impact, variety of the plant, where it comes from, uh, its tendencies, you know, that all has plays an effect, but I've always been able to keep whatever male that I wanted. Um, granted that I took it from a veg plant originally before I really knew what it was, you know. Um, and uh, on the feminizing thing, that's the best way you can craft a plant that, to be your plant or to, to look directly at what you want, want to make. It's the quickest road to where you need to go. So there's a tool for every toolbox, every, you know, job at hand. There's a different reason to do something, but I love, I love doing fem work. Oh, Johnny, did you have something you want to do? Yeah, um, I was just curious, Mr. Trees, if you have any, in, or if you've ever uh, kept males around, that instead of being like a stud and being, you know, having a bunch of traits that you're really looking for, because we said it was kind of a crapshoot, having a male that's, that's like recessive, you know, that's the exact opposite of a stud, and it just doesn't pass on anything, and how that could be a really valuable tool for people to, to have in their toolbox. And you got to unmute yourself. I, I did that to you, Mr. Trees. You, your oh, mic was giving you, a bit of feedback, so I, I <laughs> muted you there. Sorry. No, that's a, that's a great question, man. I, that is something that, that's a great, great out-of-the-box way to kind of think about things. I love, I love thinking about stuff like that. I, I don't. I don't keep a recessive male in any, any way, shape, or form, knowingly that he doesn't pass anything or he's completely mute. And uh, it will 100% allow the, the other you know, the female, the shine or whatever. Um, that's, that's definitely something cool. Uh, might be something that I, you know, will think about doing in the future. I do, however, like to select males that aren't a, like your typical stud. Um, nine out of 10 of my males that I actually do select whenever I'm working with a male or a, a traditional breeding project would be like, I always look for a, a male that's more, more dainty and more feminine, like, you know, more like the females, you know, less likely to shoot up as high and want to drop his pollen down on the females below, uh, more of the, the male that kind of fooled you, you know, you go through, you make your, they show you quick, you, you do your first round of colon, you think you got everybody, they're looking really sharp. And then that, that one plant that shows male and you thought the whole time it was a bitch and female. Uh, that those males I really like. I like I like using males like that. They're usually stinky. They're usually, you know, they usually have good traits that send over. I've never had a real bad bad seed batch come out of a male when I use use stuff like that. But as far as passing nothing or totally recessive, no, that's cool. That's that's something that I'd like to try out actually. Oh, that's a great great question, Johnny. Do you have a follow up, or I'm going to do a quick room reset if you. No, go for it, Mr. Trees, and I I appreciate you kind of dropping that um, that knowledge on the the males that are kind of the last to show. I have a couple a couple that I've just been sexing, and it's they've been really uh, resistant to kind of show their sex, and they finally I'm finally confirmed that they're males, and um, I think I'm going to keep them around. I think I'm going to keep them around and do something with them. So appreciate your your response, buddy. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw something in here just to screw everybody's mind up that, you know, those males could be females just with some something, some gene that's broken to where they present as male, but genetically they're female. Yeah, I always thought about something, something along those lines, you know. Um, with plants, that's that's radical. I mean, and, and hormonal imbalances can determine that for sure. So yeah, that that's something that would be cool. And it's like kind of like that thing that old DJ Short used to say. You know, he used to look for the males that had the hair that that would they would throw the hairs and the pistols because you know it was a benefit to whatever you know he was looking for. I don't remember exactly, but um, those more female dominant, you know, maybe female plant type plants you know i don't know i think they make make good daddies i've done lots of seed batches i mean lots of seed batches with males just like that 
and I've always I've always had people really stoked on 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 the offspring that came out of them, and they were never like like hermaphrodite prone. You know, it's never been a big thing. You know. Awesome. Well, I'm going to do a quick reset here since we're at about the half an hour point. We are the Dank Hour where we get experts together with amazing other experts and talk about awesome stuff. You get to sit on it. On in, in my mind, some of the dankest conversations happening here at Clubhouse. So don't forget to follow and like and do all the gizmos and do that. Share this room right now if you haven't already because you should have. And I'd appreciate it if you do. Now we are here um, on part two of our breeder series where we are chatting with breeders and talking about the process of starting your own breeding process. And we invite you to take the time, listen to our previous episode, listen to this episode and, and, and breed along with the show because that's, that's the idea. We want every person to find an awesome new hobby that is this cannabis plant, whether it's just getting growing because sometimes that's where you need to start or you want to try out something more advanced this is a great place for you to enjoy that point of conversation. Now, I am really excited, and this is actually the first time we've gotten to share space, um, and, and we have Blackbird Preservations, Jimmy Toucan on the stage. Welcome, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are and, you know, exactly what the fuck's going on with Blackbird Preservations? Because I, I, I'm excited to hear about it. And his first Clubhouse lesson is going to be on how to unmute himself, which you do have to do. You have to click on the speaker icon. Or the microphone. bottom right hand side of this. <laughs> Way down at the bottom. Tap the microphone. You can do it. We believe in you <laughs> on the bottom right hand side. You're I'm good enough. You're you smart it. enough. And doggone it, you can figure out how to unmute yourself. This is also a Blackbird's first time here on <laughs> Thank God for my fire. All right. Well, okay. This is what we're going to do. So, it, Jimmy, when you find the button that, that releases <laughs> the microphone on the bottom right-hand side, like literally on the furthest corner point there, you should be able to see it. But if not, we'll, we'll let you just – whenever you – Yeah, feel free out, to you interrupt once in. you figure it out. Exactly. Kyle, we did bring up on stage. He uh, he looked like he raised his hand to ask a question. Uh, yeah, you have thank a question, you. Comment or statement while we continue. And Kyle, yeah, has um, somebody was the unmute button. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me up. Uh, excellent conversation. And I just want to say uh, I'm a big fan of gassy strains myself. And my favorite strain is G6. Thank you. Awesome. So you're going to put those together in a breeding project with us during this this series that happens every six to eight weeks? Probably not, but um, I'll think about it. Awesome. Well, thank you That's for coming honesty. up on stage. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. that honesty is the most word. I appreciate you coming up on stage. So we'll continue forward again. Jimmy, if you get that mic open, you just start yelling. Like, it's totally cool. I'm, no one's going to be mad at you. Everybody heads up. So, Dr. Anavis, can we talk a little bit about kind of the misconception that's commonly found when we're talking about feminized breeding, um, specifically in regards to the stability of the plant if it's done properly? And then maybe you could talk about, I, I don't know if, if, if this will come, come right off the top of your head, or maybe Mr. Trees or someone else would like to jump in, is what exactly are, are some methods of, of testing a plant to ensure that they don't? Um, have that they aren't going to be unstable and create male female pollen that has prone to macrodism. Thank you. Okay, so I think I know what you're getting at, maybe. So, all right. Um, so, some people think that if you only breed with feminized pollen, then that's going to minimize your diversity and create problems so number one of course you don't have to like pollinate the, the female with itself you can you know feminize or you can you can reverse sex any female plant and cross it with any other female plant right so in that sense you've got two parents that are contributing their genetic information to the offspring um you would do self-fertilization if you were trying to um, stabilize your line and, and 
and breed out all of the unwanted traits. And that's great too, you can do that. Um, the second part of your question um, is about like, if you are doing feminizing and you're, you're, you're um, reverse sexing and then using that female pollen to pollinate flowers, are you creating more uh, t a tendency for herm hermaphrodism or, or, you know, for, for the female to produce male structures and pollen and nobody wants that. So yes and no, it depends on how you do it. So if you are just using um, pollen from a plant that uh, a female that just produced male structures and is creating pollen and you're like, oh, hey, look, I can make seeds. You're gonna get offspring that has a tendency to hermaphrodite because that plant has, for whatever reason, decided or, or perceived that its life is in danger, it needs to make a seed, it's gonna create pollen so that it can at least create a next generation to, to uh, another attempt to try and, 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 and breed and make seeds with an, with an elk, with a, you know, another individual. So you don't wanna use plants in a breeding program from, from females that have um, created male structures all by themselves for no apparent reason whether, or you know, whether it was a light leak or I don't know, you forgot to water it one day and it threw out some pollen sacks or some nanners or whatever the case may be. Uh, that's not gonna be, those seeds are gonna have a tendency to hurt, to harm. What you wanna do, in my opinion, is try and stress out your female. And if you cannot get it to harm, no matter what you do, those are the ones that have, you know, good genetics, they don't have a tendency to harm and produce those male pollen structures. I guess they're female pollen structures. Um, and you're gonna have some solid, solid genes there. So, um, you know, if you stress it, if you, if you give it light leaks, if you don't water it, if you, you know, do whatever to try and stress it out and it's just not throwing out any pollen structures of any kind, then you're gonna wanna do the actual like chemical process of reverse sexing. So using something like colloidal silver or, or there's a couple different ways to do it and um, sort of force it into creating pollen structures. And then you can use that pollen to create your, your seed line. So I hope that made sense. And maybe Mr. Tree can kind of, uh, I don't know, add any, add something to that. I don't know. Yeah, so, you know, uh, Mendel said, like begets like, so that guides me on lots of things. You know, if a, if a female plant is likely to to throw, you know, intersex or has intersex traits, then that's not a good candidate, you know, in, in most cases for, you know, breeding or being a good mother or any of those things. Because then the, the offspring that, that produces from that, uh, however good it may be, you'll always have that extra percent or that chance of more intersex children so best way to, to go about that is to have a durable plant that doesn't do that kind of like you were saying uh, there's a billion and, and one different ways to kind of stress out a plant to kind of figure out if it's a good good mother or not some people go to crazy extremes some people don't do it at all um, things that i like to do is uh, usually foolproof if, if you put a plant in like a one gallon pot or, or, or a small root you know depending on how you grow it, it could vary but for me, if I put it in a very small rooting root space, like a one gallon pot or smaller uh, and flower it, yeah, it gets dry really quick, runs out of food really quick, uh, gets hot on the outside real quick, root ball gets a little stressed. That, that'll usually, you know, that'll usually flip a plant that's easily you know, flipped pretty quick. It'll show you, you know, usually by week three, right there, week three and a half, three, four, you'll, you'll know it, you know, in most cases. Um, there are plants that can, that can, you know, throw late flowers, you know, way later in flower, but that's a whole nother con you know, conversation. Uh, but yeah, so the plant that doesn't do that in a one gallon plant, it's, it's kind of dried out a couple of times and had a, had a harder time and did all those things, usually pretty durable. And if you grow that thing again, uh, and really kind of grow it well and kind of take, take care of it and see what happens, that, that'll tell you a lot about its character as well. Um, the more you grow anything, the more you're going to learn about it. But you could throw it in a, one, a small root space, 
you can feed it really excessive, um, you know, nutrients, you know, some, some people say, give it a bunch of high nitrogen or whatnot, but I find just, just feed it excessively. That'll piss them off. Um, you can flip them, you know, take them out They're They're in a night cycle. You take them out and look at them, you know, shine, you know, pull them out and do, do pruning on them in the light while they're supposed to be sleeping. That pisses off plants really good. Uh, you'll, you'll know it real quick. Um, if, if a plant is touchy, if you do some stuff like that, uh, but there's a million ways to get it to kind of flip, but you know, the, if you got a plant that is the profile that you want, that is durable, doesn't flip easy and takes chemical intervention to, to really, you know, go the distance, then that's a good, that's a good host plant. And that's something that, that you want to kind of, you kind of want to work with. Um, that being said, you know, all the best plants out there in the world today that dominate the world are all touchy. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but yeah, maybe we well, do we've chatted that. about it a little bit. And, and <laughs> the thing is when you, when you get, when you get such a, when you start having plants that have such a high THC and such a high, like such a high percentage of all these phytochemicals, like if the plant's only putting energy into that, it loses energy in other space. So I feel like that could be an underlying cause of some of this situation and issue where like, that's why you get into those. I just saw an unmute mic from Jimmy. Do we have you here? Can you say hello? Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I guess maybe leaving and coming back was the ticket. Yes, it worked. Yes. Holy yeah, shit. Like, that I, was my troubleshooting. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right on. maybe just quit and come back. The mic, the mic was wide open. I thought, well, I'm, I'm trying, but. <laughs> yeah, we, we were texting screen. Like, I took a screenshot and I, and I brought it into Photoshop and I put a big red circle around the microphone with like red arrows pointing to it. And I texted it to him. I was like, tap this button. And then he sent me one back that showed that it's actually like on his end, the mic is on. Yeah. So as anyway. far as I knew, as far as, uh, you know, my, my screen was telling me, I, you know, you should have heard me. So I, I, All right, I well, well, you have now mastered the most critical function of Clubhouse, which is unmuting yourself. <laughs> so from here on out, it's all gravy. Right on. So, so the stuff you've been listening to, you have any? <laughs> were you like, I have something to say, but nobody can hear me? <laughs> now I'm now now I now I have to go back and think about. Uh, yeah, there was there was something. Um, uh, oh, it's, yeah, as far as like choosing, you know, choosing males and whatnot, um, you know, for, for like an open pollination, you know, just choose everything that's healthy and well, it, you know, it helps to, to research what you're, you know, what you're digging into and, and try and find out if you haven't already, you know, smoked it and, uh, you know, have any knowledge. So, you know, try and research what, what, what the you know, what it's supposed to be like, right? And, you know, maybe leave out some of the outliers, but for the most part, anything that, that comes within that um, kind of idea what it's supposed to be. But, you know, if you want to do something more focused, yeah, choose a, you know, choose a male that, that's a lot like the female that you like the most. You know, if you've gone through a population and you find a girl that, you know, really suits you and, and that's what you, you know, want to move forward with. I definitely look for a fella that's, um, you know, as much like the sister as possible without, you know, without, um, you know, fancy equipment and, and, and whatnot. We don't know what exactly, um, you know, what traits are close on the, uh, you know, on the DNA strand. So you have some, some linked traits because they're right next to each other that you can, you know, I mean, if you, like I said, if you have the equipment, you know what to look for, but, um, you know, as, as, um, you know, people that are breeding out of their houses and whatnot, and even a, a small facility or whatever, you, you're, you're going by sight and smell and, um, you know, maybe you can reverse the mail and, and, um, and get a better idea of what the, um, you know, the terpene expression is and all the, all the different stuff that makes up the smell. Um, you know, that would be, uh, you know, that would be my direction. And, and as far as like, 
uh, recessive males, maybe not entirely recessive, but, you know, it's not a bad thing because, you know, not for nothing, but, you know, when I bought a lot of seeds, um, you know, it was because of one of the parents and it's usually because of the mom, right? You know, you're like, well, I'm never going to get the clone or I just don't have the, you know, I, I don't keep them or whatever. I just want to check out some stuff that's a lot like the mom. So that comes in really handy. And a lot of the times, the, you know, the big bitch about really great females is, or you know, plants in general is, you know, maybe the, the structure isn't real sound and, you know, they're, they're always flopping over. And, um, you know, so maybe something that just adds a little, a, a little bones, you know, a little sturdiness to the, uh, to the carriage. and you know, maybe, you know, maybe a little, a little resin or something like that, but yeah, something that's unobtrusive and, you know, mainly it's like, don't, don't take away from the, um, you know, the tastes and the smells and, 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 and the effect, you know, anything else is like, oh, who gives a fuck, right? If it looks completely different, but it tastes and smells like the mom and, and, and it has the same type of ride, then who cares? Um, but that you know, it takes takes a lot of looking. So those are my thoughts, anyway. Hey, I wanted to just jump in real quick and address this idea of recessive males. Like recessive traits, right? You've got to have two copies of that recessive gene in order for it to be expressed as a recessive trait. So if you're getting recessive traits shown with your male, that also means the female is carrying that same recessive trait. She's only, she's heterozygous for whatever that trait may be. So you, it's not the male necessarily that's the problem, although he only has that recessive trait to, to donate to the next generation. She's got one too. Um, and, you know, this idea of dominant and recessive, that's every single Every single gene, every single thing that that plant expresses is going to be either homozygous or heterozygous, dominant with two dominant alleles. It can be heterozygous with one dom dominant and one recessive allele, or it can be homozygous recessive with two recessive alleles. And, you know, as long as you get two copies of that recessive allele, it's going to show. If you've got a do dominant gene and you get one copy of that recessive allele, the dominant is going to show. But not everything is dominant or recessive. There's also things that are co-dominant or come where you get a mixed, you know, co-dominant means both of them are expressed. It, it, one isn't dominant completely over the other. There are linked traits, um, things that always come in, in together like red hair and freckles. Most of the time, if you have red hair, you're going to have freckles. Um, same thing in plants. So this idea of recessive that people throw around is not always completely accurate. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there to get people's brains kind of worrying about how these things work in in the real world. Yeah, which is why it's important to not only grow out the the, the progeny, but the results of the progeny. You know, take those to F two and also breed out your males against multiple females that you've bred out against multiple males. Um, again, without, you know, we're making observations. So without fancy equipment and everything, we don't really know what's, uh, you know, what, tra what traits are linked. And, um, so even it's, with the, even with the fancy equipment, we don't know enough about the cannabis genome to say, oh, that plant has that trait. This plant has that trait. These, you know, like we just don't, we don't, we know hardly anything. Yeah. If you breed, if you genome. breed a male, if you breed an IBL against a bunch of different you know, 30 different females, you're going to get a pretty, pretty good idea of what shines through. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, traditional you, breeding methods. You can methods call it what you want, but when, you know, when I breed, I was, when I breed a PCK against anything, whether it's male or female side, all the progeny are going to show some, some bit of anthocyanins in yeah, I was just talking about like the fancy equipment, like that's gonna look at the you know the genotype and like oh you can get your you know sequence sure, done and give you an idea. You can take a look at the you know you can get a close look at it, but again, it's it's all about 
Um, you know, oh, I was just saying we don't know enough about this. And, I'm just saying we don't know enough about the genome to send it into people with fancy genetic equipment for them to say, oh, your plant's going to look like this, because we don't know. So before we get too far into this, I'd like to step it back a bit and ask Jimmy, uh, because we didn't get the opportunity to actually hear a little bit about you and Blackbird Preservations. Could you talk about that? And uh, we can learn a little bit about you and who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah, it all, it all started out of a, a pack of Northern Lights that you know, I was just doing for myself and, um, you, know, call, you know, picked it up on a, on a, well, not an auction, but a kind of buy it now type of thing. They're rare seeds. And I spent, a, you know, a fair bit of money for them. So I figured, well, I'm going to make some more for myself. So I have, you know, more to look through. And, um, you know, there was a, a bunch of people that were tagging along that were wondering if I had any more and if they were going to be available. and. So, you know, I, I, I think there was maybe 30 packs that I put out and, um, you know, it was just a, you know, fact of, yep, it's a rare pack and a lot of people didn't get a chance to scoop them. So we uh, made a few more and, and then I got in contact with Snow High and I asked him about the chocolate tie that he had that was very limited. Um, so we did that and we kicked some, kicked some seeds and some other things back to snow for the for the opportunity and and it just kind of grew from there um and then just going through and doing the preservations uh, i've had a chance to look at a lot of different plants and in the meantime i've acquired a lot of different plants and so it's it's kind of spread from you know the the preservation work like with my last uh the previous drop with the lemon tie it was you know I, preserved the lemon tie and I found this, uh, you know, this great male and hit him with a bunch of stuff and, you know, kept that line going. And then I got a hold of, um, uh, Bodie's cut a lemon tie. So I did a second iteration of the, of the Dutch flowers release. And, um, yeah, it's just kind of gone from there. I'm, you know, the, the base of it is really is, is, you know, preserving some of the, some of the pure lines that, you know, the building blocks, the things that we've seen over the years, some of them are land race type stuff that, you know, farmed land races that have uh, um, come into the hands of some good people. And, you know, we did the Hill Tribe Mung Thai, which is an amazing line. Um, you know, the Vietnamese Black, which I have in a couple of different things now. And um, so, yeah, it's just kind of grew from there. And, and uh, so I'm just trying to keep it going right now we got a lot of things lined up this summer that are in the works and some things that are drying and curing right now and so it's been a lot of uh, it's been a lot of fun awesome and you do have some really cool stuff and i do want to mention that the breeders that are showcased as our guests tonight mr trees J uh, jimmy from blackbird uh, preservations you can actually find all their gear on Dagadog garden that you can see at the top of the page here at clubhouse or um, if you're on YouTube, you can find that in the description right at the top so that you make sure you can support these guys and, and, and give back to the community. So I wanted, I was wondering, you know, we leaned on Mr. Treats pretty heavily in the earlier part of the the discussion, but I'd love to hear hear it from you and give you a chance to, to take the stage for a little bit there, Jimmy, is I'd love to hear about the process and, and about when a sort see when a plant is um, pollinated and the amount of time that it takes for that seed to develop and how to know when it's a proper time to harvest plant to harvest for seed. Yeah, I, you know, and, and like a lot of like a lot of questions, the answer is it depends, right? Like the um, you know the faster running varieties can well most often you know they they make their seeds pretty quick, um, you know five six weeks and you know you, you'll, you'll see a lot of ripe um you know fully mature seeds where the knacker is you know it's got that nice sheen on it and they're busting out of their um you know whatever the technical term is for it their their jackets is what i call it um you know and then some of the longer running varieties they really take their time um with with some exceptions though that cut of oas that i have uh makes makes really fast seed and makes a lot of it um i do like the um uh the more kind of narrow leaf expressions 
as far as making seeds because they're they're just branchier and stretchier and and there's just more uh they're more airy you know the the flower set and it makes for a lot of room for each seed to develop there's you know sometimes you'll get a you know one of those those faster girls that that everything's really clumped together and they almost get like over pollinated you know and you get a lot of white seed and and not a lot of uh uh you know a grade type stuff out of them um but yeah i mean you know for the most part the 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 faster running girls are a little quicker to make their seed they got to get their shit done um and then the the longer flowering varieties of course you know it takes christ you know it, it could be six weeks before you see any bit of real flower set on them um and then you know another you know eight weeks later maybe you got seed so it 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 does depend on the on the varietal and as far as like you know knowing when they're ready you know it's it's again it's when they're when they're freeing themselves from the plant and they take zero effort to get them away, you know, and a lot of times, like I said, you'll, you'll see them split that jacket open and you'll see that beautiful, um, you know, that beautiful shiny, uh, seed knacker kind of peeking out. So that's, uh, you know, again, so it's, it, it depends, but somewhere between six and eight weeks. Excellent. And do you suggest like almost allowing the plant to, to, to close out its life cycle and just let it kind of die? Or do you suggest like kind of putting a timer for eight weeks max and that's kind of when you take it? Well, actually, well, what I do is I just pull them out once once they, they the seeds are, you know, from what I can tell are, are ready. I'll pull the plant out of the room, especially if I'm out of room, which is almost always. So I'll pull it out and just let it dry out naturally. Um, you know, I'll just let it hang out in a, you know, in an empty space and, and let it kind of dry out. It's usually what I do at the end of like, you know, for harvest or whatever, you can tell cause I hand water. So you can tell like the day that those plants stop, you know, the kind of kick it from, you know, first, you know, third gear back down into second or first gear and they really stop drinking. And then it's time to stop watering. And when the bucket dries out, then I'll pull them out of the room and, and, and just let them fade off and dry out a little bit before I, before I even cut them down. So it's kind of the same thing with the seeds, only I'll let them sit longer. Cool. And so like, I, I let, so from that point forward, would you suggest, like, do you suggest, so you've got your seed, you've, you've, Bought, you've gotten you've separated them out and maybe we'll grab mr trees after we go into this you've gotten them out is there a specific way like should you put them on a rack to dry a little bit before you before you put them in a jar um is it can you just put them in a glass jar all together should you put a little bit what is it the old desiccant or what where, where it dehydrates the air uh, what's your suggestion for storing those beans post uh yeah for me it well it depends on the season too right like i live close to water so it's really humid in the summertime um i can you, you know like they'll start to dry out but like the same thing with flour um i can't dry anything in august right it'll just sit and be it'll stay at like well i don't know what it would be maybe 65 percent uh uh rh if you jarred it right if you had a hygrometer in there um so you know, like in the wintertime, no problem. I'll just set it out on a paper plate or a tray or something like that and let them dry for a week or two. And then I'll store them with like a little bit of desiccant just to pull out the last little bit of moisture. Um, cold shock, you know, they got to go in the cold storage. Um, you know, they have a, a, a stratification, I guess is the term for it. You know, like for um, ginseng out here, there's a big you know, pull for ginseng in this area and those seeds have to, they spend two years before they'll germinate, right? Like they'll, they'll get dropped one fall and they have such a shell on them that it, it takes two freeze thaw cycles before they'll germinate. Um, so I, you know, that, that cold shock, I think is really important to kind of, um, sedate the, you know, sedate the seed and think it's going through that normal, cycle where you know they're dropped but it's not ready to germ 
you know, you don't want them to germinate in the fall. So they react to that cold, you know, that those cold temperatures and kind of go to sleep. And so that that's my gay guy, you know, two weeks, let them dry and then and then cold storage. Awesome. Great response. I, I, if, it's I like the, uh, if it's the summer, if it's the summer and it's really moist and humid, then I let them sit out for that initial, like, you know, five to seven days. And then I'll jar them up with like a bunch of desiccant to dry them out. Smart, smart. And do you just use packet desiccant or do you like use like dried rice or anything like that? Or, or do you just... yeah, I'm I I I buy rice by the 20 pound bag, so I always have it around. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I appreciate it. So Joseph popped up on the stage. Now I'm gonna open this up now. If you're in the audience or you are on uh, future cannabis project. Go ahead and raise your hand, ask a question. Go ahead and stay there. I've tried to write down if there was other, other questions beforehand, but I didn't really see much of any. Um, so for our, our so we're opening up now for discussion, um, for you to come in and ask our everything. So Joseph is the first one up on stage. You happen to have probably quite a bit earlier, uh, and I would love to ask you: Do you have question, comment, or statement for a panel of experts today? Hey there. Uh, thanks, guys. It's been great listening to you all. Um, I'm a cannabis farmer up in the Emerald Triangle, done some breeding myself. Um, had a question about males um, and growing mediums um, and sort of nutrient regimens um, and kind of what your guys' thoughts are. Um, you know, give them the same amount of nutrients as the females, give them more, give them less. Uh, you know, plant them in bare growing medium, plant them in the raw earth. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts? Um, thanks. Did, did you want to ask anyone specifically, like our special guest, Mr. Trees or Jimmy uh, in particular, or did you want, were you just asking an open question as well for the group to answer? Because then I'll just. Uh, that's. An open question. I mean, I've heard from Mr. Trees and Jimmy, so if one of you guys want to share, um, yeah, just kind of curious on what your guys' thoughts are with it. Maybe we should go around the room and ask. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine they're treated the same, but I'm no expert in holding male plants. Uh, Mr. Trees looks like he's jumping at the bit here, so we'll give him the opportunity to. No, I was going to say was I treat them all the same, man. There's nothing I do differently with the males. I, I'm, I'm growing the males so that I can get the females to do what I want. So if the males are doing and falling in line with the program, then they're probably a good contender for for later on making good females that are going to follow the program. So I don't do anything different with them. Um, I just like using the, you know using them against multiple things so that I can actually see what the hell they do. So, but yeah, nothing special. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm kind of playing around with a, a running theory um, over the last like uh, 10 years or so, um, been growing male and female and, and doing the selecting and vegetative ratio. Um, and uh, what I've been playing around with is like, if the females are being grown in, in luscious soil with all, all the nutrients they need, and if the males are getting the same thing, are we breeding a lineage that's adapting to higher nutrient needs. Um, don't know the answer. Uh, my intuition says yes. And so been playing around with, with just growing males in uh, like raw native plant soil, kind of with this idea of origin um, in mind of, you know, what were the plants doing uh, before we started uh, cultivating them in the ways that we are today. Um, but yeah, just an idea I'm playing around with. And I don't know if any of you guys have any feedback or thoughts on that, but uh, yeah, I would love to hear what you guys think of that idea theory. I'm uh, I'm super cheap, cheap, man. So I, I always teach my culture to like, you know, just I'm using I'm using native earth mixed with very little uh, low nutrients only when they absolutely need it. I, I, I rely heavily on just 
the worm castings from the from from the farms that I have, um, and that's I, I totally agree with you. Uh, and like, we can push things to need certain things. Uh, I, I've been doing kind of a similar thing with with clone with cloning gel. You know, I'll make five clones of something, and then I'll make five more. Uh, I'll make five clones of something with clone gel, and then I'll make five more of the same ones without it. And if I can get the ones to root without it, I take I usually take those ones, um, you know, for for everything special um, for myself. But you know, I don't know if some of those old cuts are, you know, grown like hungry for the clone gel or the nutrients because of their conditions, or you know, it's something that I've always kind of wondered myself. But me, I'm a minimalist anyway, so everything gets minimal, and if they outperform, then we're rolling, you know. This is a heads up, Jimmy. I did give your mic a mute because there was a little bit of background noise, and in case you had a private conversation going, I didn't want everyone to hear it, just in case, just in case. Uh, but I did want to jump in and say, like, I, I think there's, you're, you're, you're viewing a really good point here is that when you're doing breeding, and my understanding is when you're doing breeding, is like you're going to, the strongest plants in your system are going to favor that system. So if you're going regeneratively, plants that do best in regenerative, in your regenerative method, their offspring will be better and you just keep going along these paths that's kind of why we have a lot of plants that are that are so stuck on salt-based fertilizers and these really crazy consistent levels because they have never seen anything else other than that so you get like really wicked instability now johnny as our resident um like regenerative natural guy could you talk a little bit about like plant selection when it comes to outdoor growing and what your what your thought process is there when using these methodologies? If you're, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so the way the a plant is going to express is going to dr uh, vary so dramatically based on so many different factors. Um, when really, you know, the word phenotype is kind of that um the influence of of environmental with the genetic code that it has so you all of these things whether it's in um you know inside outside grown under um high pressure sodium versus led grown with synthetic nutrients and grown with uh, organic you're going to have all these different expressions or even if you have the same um same exact clone you're going to see variants um, so really, you know, it, I'd say it's just, I feel like there's not enough, um, um, disclosure and transparency where breeders are doing their, their selections. Um, and you'll have, you know, issues that can come up from it. A lot of th things that are really, really stable outside, um, you throw them inside and they're going to be, uh, have high rates of intersect developing intersex uh, traits. And I mean, so it's, yeah, just picking and choosing. If you know you're going to be growing something organically, um, but you source your genetics from, you know, somebody who's, who's growing in cocoa core and they're doing their selections based off of, you know, um, you know, their high salt regiment that they're doing inside and you're trying to grow organically outside um you know results may vary dramatically um so really i mean i don't know if i'm answering your question here at london or if i'm going off to topic completely. you're nailing it you're oh good good <laughs> but yeah so i i guess just knowing where you know where your genetics are coming from how it was treated as it was being cultivated and, and you know taking that into consideration because yeah, you could end up with something completely different or high rates of, of plants herm uh, herming out uh, where someone may have not had that in their setup. So, um, yeah, just I think that's the, the gist of it. And uh, take it away, London. You're sure. spitting Shakespeare, brother. Boom, drop the mic ball. Mic, mic, microphone, not ball. I don't want to say ball. Regardless, moving on. Um, <laughs> That was fucking really well done, Johnny. You, you you nailed it exactly. So Woody Stems asks, fucking great name. Uh, best favorite way to dry 
pollen and probably why don't we go into it dry and store pollen because I'm sure there's a few people listening to this episode that are at this stage might be thinking oh fuck I got all this pollen what do I do with it can I store it can I use it what can I do later and I would like to actually hear from both of you so let's start with Jimmy and then go to Mr. Trees and get each one of your own input on this specific subject so Jimmy don't forget I muted you there you go yeah, um, so usually I, uh, I, I collect on, um, you know, it's, you know, it's really handy dandy are the, the, the boxes that you get like, um, you know, something long and skinny in, um, you know, like golf clubs or something like that. I have a couple of bat boxes that I saved, um, and I line it with, uh, parchment paper and shake the mails over that. And once it's dry, maybe four, again, depending on the uh, the time of year, I really don't try and collect in, you know, in the, the dead of summer just because it just, everything stays so wet and sticky. Um, but um, usually like four or five days and you can scrape it up, um, send it through, I can't remember what, uh, I think it's a 150U uh, screen that I have that I send the pollen through just to get any of the live bits out. Cause that's the last thing you want in there or, you know, uh, organic material, other organic material. Um, and, uh, I store it with, with a little bit of rice or desiccant and just keep it cold and dark. I don't freeze it. Um, only because I don't trust my freezer. You know, it's got like the freeze thaw cycle or the defrost cycle on it. So I figured you just keep it at a, uh, an even temperature sealed up and in the dark and, Um, I've had no problem with it. You know, I I don't think I've kept anything longer than a year and a half or two, but, um, it does start to degrade a little bit, but that's, that's my method. Um, and it seems to work. Um, I used to, I used to try to collect and store more pollen than I do these days. Now I usually just pollinate the the females with the live you know pollen donor um in action and then make sure that everything gets cleaned up and i'm I'm done with it Uh, i there are instances where um i got really good at storing pollen and holding on to pollen and kind of figuring out what i could and couldn't do with it um that being said i never ended up i never freeze it because i never had success with it and i rarely put it in the refrigerator um and I would try to use it pretty darn quick. I'd you get your plant, and what the way that I'd collect it if I was going to collect pollen, um, I would I would wait for the plant to get ready to start flowering before it was just when maybe just a couple of the male flowers were starting to open. Um, but it was getting ready to bust, but it hadn't quite busted yet. And I would I would snip off a couple of those branches just like they were like roses getting ready to fully open, you know. And I'd take take those branches and I'd clean them up, take off the majority of the leaves and all that jazz. And I put them in a, you know, in a glass of water or a water bottle or something with a little bit of moisture. You could wrap them up in a, in a wet paper towel, put them in a dry Ziploc bag and, you know, just kind of wrap them up with, you know, a rubber band or whatever, just kind of just make a little, little, little flower bouquet or whatever. And uh, then I'll take it and kind of do, do what uh, Jimmy was saying, you know, you get yourself a good box Uh, and some parchment paper Uh, I use a a taller box so that so that pollen doesn't blow around you know if like you know the door opens or something happens or you know what have you a draft goes through what whatnot so I'll use like a a deep tall box and I'll set that that little bouquet of flowers in like the corner kind of sitting up and if I'm in a bottle or whatever I'll set it in the corner and then I'll bend over the the flowers so that they're over the top of the parchment paper kind of and as soon as you don't even need any light really at all either you can keep it in the dark i've done it hundreds of times you can just have the the ambient light you can put it by a window whatever but you put it someplace that doesn't get windy and you leave it there and all the pollen will just drop from those flowers over like two day period right onto the parchment paper nice and clean nice and easy and i'll just drop down there and then you can gently pull that that bouquet out of there shake off whatever tap it a little bit drop the rest on there and then then you got a parchment paper thing full of pollen that you can clean up and you clean it up you get all the 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 material out of it make sure it's clean i don't screen it i don't fiddle with it anymore i just make sure it's darn clean i spend a little bit of time moving it back and forth and getting the crap out of there and 
watching for any bugs that might jump around there that are small and, and all that stuff. And after it's been clean and kind of sitting out there for, you know, a day, you know, maybe I'll get to it one, you know, all in one day. Maybe it'll take me two days to finish it off, but it'll sit there and dry even more. And then I'll put it into a, I'll either make a little envelope with that said um, parchment paper and just wrap it up in its own little envelope. Never had to scrape it or move it or anything. And then I take that envelope, fold it, throw it in like a Ziploc bag with a couple desiccant little packets. And then I'll uh, throw that in like, you know, a cool place, you know, in the kitchen or the in the bathroom, throw it up in a cupboard in some dark, cool place. And I've I've used pollen stored that way for, you know, six months, eight months. It's good for I've used it with good success. Every every month, you know, you're going to get less and less success unless that pollen's going to it's going to lose viability, you know, pretty quickly. You're not refrigerating it. You're not uh, freezing it. And the reason I don't is I don't want to take the risk with any any moisture. I don't even want to fiddle with it. Every time that I do anyway, you, you, you just you just got to take it, you know, unless you're doing it serious in a serious situation where you can really, you know, properly seal everything in a scientific way. You know, I don't bother freezing stuff anymore. Um, I will refrigerate seeds, but that's a whole nother story. And, and you know, it's dry enough when it flows like like talcum powder, you know, it should never clump or. You know, you should be exactly. able to move it like exactly. it's dust. And, and as soon as it's so, you know, it's all relative, whatever, wherever you are. If you're in Colorado, your shit's going to fucking dry out in like 12 hours, right? Um, but um, so, yeah, when it, when it moves around freely, um, then you can just jar it up or, you know, however you want to package it. And then you should be good to go. It's just important to get it dry. And, um, you know, I, I think just like, you know, it's like seeds. They don't have to be in some fancy fucking deep freeze 900 fucking degrees below fahrenheit it just maintain temperature i think that's the the most important part is that wherever they are or you know wherever your pollen is that it's at a, a fairly constant temperature no matter what time of the year it is hell yeah 100 percent. if your shit's clumpy you're in trouble <laughs> Don't even try. So I make a t-shirt out of that slogan. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so here, here's a question I have. So if someone were to, you know, have, because we're talking about pollen here and oftentimes if somebody is growing cannabis, it's not usually particularly for, in, particularly just for breeding. It's, it's very rarely a source. Probably they have some medication and they want to explore this new thing. So my question for, for both of you, and we'll start with Mr. Tree and then go to Jimmy and reverse it this time. It's kind of our, our final question for the night before we get a little rundown about you guys. Um, is what can one do if what, if you know there was pollen released in a, in a room that you're looking to keep Sensimalia as an all-female unpregnated flower? What, what, what can we do? Is, is a pollen immediately pregnated it? Can we can we do something to stop the pollen from, from getting all the way down there? Is there something we can do? I lost you. Are you there? Or was it my yeah, end? Yeah. You're, okay. You're, oh, yeah. You're, so the only thing, the only thing you're going to do to stop pollen is water. Um, if you're trying to, if you have a plant that goes, if you have a plant that, that, throw some pollen and you didn't want it to throw pollen in a room full of females. Best thing you can do is try to get the females wet or wet down the area to prevent any pollen from blowing around and sticking to them. But if it's already happened and it's near other plants, it's already happened. It's, it's microscopic and it's happening, but some of that you might be able to postpone if it's not right on, right on top of it. But you gotta, you gotta, if, if you've had a pollination inside of a room or inside of a structure, I mean, water is the only thing that, you know, you, it'll kill pollen right away. So um, you can use water and something. You can mix the water and bleach if you want, or you can just use a squirt bottle. I carry a squirt bottle with me whenever I got a lot of pollen that I'm dealing with. And I just hook it to my, hook it to my hip or to my belt with my, with my shears and stuff like you guys know. And I just carry a squirt bottle and I'll squirt down myself, just miss myself and I'll miss down plants. Um, you can, you can take plants, you know, like to have a male outside and 
take a female that's inside, take it out outside to the male, pollinate the female outside, you know, give it a day. Next day, you can hose down the female, squirt it down with that, that squirt bottle and stick it back in, inside with the rest of the females and you won't have any problems. Um, it won't contaminate the other females, no problem. I've done that hundreds of times. Um, it's just water is your best friend. It's the best thing you can do. Sorry, I'll stop talking. Tyler, I have a very important question. Yeah, Peter. How frequently do you strap on the RoboCop Edward Scissorhand Falco uh, hydraulic? Oh, the eight twenty man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my, my, my. And how satisfying is? Or do you feel once you strap it on? God, I love it, man. It feels really good. It's like you're you're like RoboCop or something when you get it on. It, it really it like clutches your back a certain way. It's just backpack. It's this battery powered shear that can hack branches up to like three inches plus and like just a push of a button it's the coolest thing ever that um, thing cut down trees yeah like nobody's business it is the bomb I, I i use that every day almost man honestly every day and the cool thing about that thing is it counts your cuts so um what i learned was i do i do like somewhere around ten thousand cuts um you know every couple weeks some months, you know, depending on the busy years, um, up to like, you know, 10,000 cuts up to like every two months. So it gets used. That's for sure. Man. I imagine that counter could be really handy for, for, for when you're doing trees. <laughs> it's like how many cuts of this branch? Yeah, man, I was having problems with my arms and stuff, like, you know, getting carpal tunnel and tearing up my shoulders and all kinds of shit. And I'm like, God, I got to do something different. So I, I found that tool and I started using that tool instead. And uh, it told me that I was doing 10,000 cuts freaking that, that, that often. And I'm like, I was doing that for years, almost a decade. So it just shredded my arms. So I was like, oh, shit, taught me how much work you're actually doing and you don't really realize it. So working smarter is definitely the way to go. You know, tools are the best way to go, man. Get a good tool. Peter, how, how strong is Mr. Tree's handshake? Cause I imagine you have a ferocious fucking handshake. Then <laughs> It's like the recessive males we were talking about. It's very uh, passive and limp. <laughs> I got, uh, I got three boys. So that tells you a lot about what's going on here, you know. <laughs> I have, I, I have for one delighted in this conversation. As, as you all are always disappointed to found out, we like to keep these conversations tight and respect our experts' time because we have a lot of amazing people come in for these discussion. But before we go, there's one crucial thing that we absolutely need you to be here to listen to. So if, and if you haven't already, definitely check out Dagadog Garden at the top. But before we go there, I want to know, first of all, we did Mr. Therese, you were here at the start, but Jimmy, how can the community, whether it be on YouTube, Future Cannabis Project, or here on Clubhouse, support you as a breeder in your endeavors and adventures in the world of cannabis? Yeah, so um, I, have, uh, I have a website where, where I do... Um uh some woodworking we do rolling trays and stash boxes i have some uh leather work some laser engraved uh uh leather bound grow journals things of that nature you can find that at um dirtybirdtradingco.com um as far as the um you know the breeding is concerned you know you can follow me at uh, Blackbird Preservations on Instagram and uh, just show it off, you know, grab some gear, hit me up if you have any questions or, you know, like if you're wondering what, what, what you want to dig into, I try and provide, you know, long flowering varieties, shorter flowering stuff, um, you know, lots of different flavors, um, you know, preserving some of the old, old, uh, classics and so if you want to dig into that you go to blackbird preservations uh my personal account on ig is at j2 cans you can check out all kinds of stuff there as well so um the the best way to the best way to get down though is, is really is grab some gear share what you found um you know show it off 
Make more seats. Hell yeah, that's exactly the type of word you would like to hear from people that come out to the show when it comes to these segments. Don't just buy the seeds and grow the seeds, breed the seeds, be part of the community, be part of my adventure. Yeah, I fucking love that mentality, Jim. Yeah, well, you know, love and it. a lot of the times, you know, like I've, I've, I've gone through a lot of different varieties and it's like sometimes I just, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I got a lot more shit to do. So, you know, if you picked up this or that, make more because I don't know if I'm going to get back to it. You know, if people want my selections, they'll get my selections. I'm not worried about, um, you know, you making something out of, you know, something that I reproduced and 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 you know stealing my thunder like you know people you know the, that that's the best part and 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 really an important part of the provenance and letting people know like you know especially when you're preserving something um you know we want to know where it came from who made the previous selections who made these selections because we you know all we could get we get 10 of us all together in a two year project with the same fucking line and we could make selections for two straight years. Right. And at the end, we're all going to have, you know, a little bit different, maybe even wildly different, depending on what we start with, uh, you know, a, a different, uh, you know, a different line almost. Right. At that point, nice. You go five, six generations, you got, you know, it could be something entirely different. So, you know, keeping the provenance, letting everybody know where it came from, who worked on it previously. And, and then you get to know, like, well, what are they selecting for, right? So, um, yeah, just keep it going. Keep the groove going. Hell yeah. We love you, Jimmy. We appreciate you joining. So and who are, some, who are some of the breeders who you get excited to play with what they've kind of, like, directions they've pushed things in? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I love Mean Gene's shit because – he works with a lot of old stuff and he's also an outdoor breeder. So it's kind of a two for one is he works with a lot of classic gear and he breeds outdoors, which brings a lot, you know, cause I, I run 90% of my stuff is run indoors. So, you know, I like to look for that kind of thing for, you know, pest resistance and uh, you know, just being, you know, having that, that extra dynamic in there. Um, Snow high because of all the crazy shit that he works with. Um, Bodhi, of course, you know, I've used a, a bunch of his stuff, uh, reproductions and in, in, in crosses. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a couple of his cuts. So, um, you know, guys like that, then, then there's a ton of smaller breeders out there that are doing the, they're doing the good work, you know, they're, they're keeping stuff alive. The, the building blocks, the, the kind of things that, we're going to want to revisit at some point, at least, you know, as, as the gene pool gets muddied and in desserts and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's all bag of peel and, you know, whatever. I, I, I've smoked a lot of it. It, it I, I can't really tell the difference between most of it, you know? Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. Let's just keep, uh, let's keep the, uh, the old stuff alive and, and uh and have fun brilliant mr trees how can the community at clubhouse and on future cannabis projects go about supporting you and your endeavors in the world of cannabis and breeding and tree breeding for them well uh no well first man i just want to you know salute jimmy man he's you know blackbird's the real deal people should check out his stuff his trays and his um, books, his little, little leather books, poetry books and stuff, man, they're cool. Notebooks, they're badass, man. Uh, really are. No, no shit. Um, as far as me, you know, people can find me. I'm, I'm on IG, Family Tree Seeds, at Family Tree Seeds. Um, I've got my YouTube channel, Mr. Trees, about plants and trees and all kinds of fun stuff. You got um, this place, there's Embracing Organics. I'm in all kinds of online you know shows and programs so you can you can just search for mr trees most anywhere and i'll pop up um as far as supporting and stuff man you can you know keep visiting daga that's great that's a great place to go um 
you know, it's good people, good stuff. Try to keep it keep it filled up with cool things. Um, and, and if you need, uh, you know, problems or questions or issues, or you need it, you know, help with help with your trees. There's all kinds of different, you know, services. And you know, I love answering questions and helping things. There's all kinds of stuff that I can do. There's the worm business and the farm business. There's all kinds of, you know, fruits and veggies that we're going to be launching and doing. So, you know, just link up with me, hit me up on IG or the YouTube or here and we'll, you know, we'll get you hooked up with, with one of the cool things or all of the cool things that's going on. So I'm also doing some the coffee cup seed deals going on again too. So anybody knows about that, just like I said, hit me up man. we'll get, we'll get seeds in the garden. So much love to all you guys, man. Thanks for even, you know, have me up here. Well, I mean, I, I've had an awesome conversation. I think everybody else has too. Do any of the experts have a closing statement for today um, before we finish off the show and say good night to everybody? Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for having me on. It was a, it was an honor to share the stage with Mr. Trees. Um, you know, I watch what he's got going on. I, I, I keep a pretty small circle, but I think it's a good circle. So um, much love to everybody and um, you know, if there's anything, you know, that, that, that you have any questions on the gear or, um, you know, the products that I have, please hit me up at Blackbird. That's the public one. Um, so you can always, you can always access me there and, um, you know, keep it growing. Thank you. Awesome. And I do have a favor for everybody in the audience and I have a favor for everybody that is out on YouTube as well that we have, I had an awesome thing, and I, 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 I'm sure you guys know of this fantastic human being uh, called uh, Jordan River from Growcast Podcast, another awesome channel as well. I happen to have the opportunity um, to get to interview him this morning at 9 a.m. for Cannabis for Breakfast. So please, I pop that link at the top of the channel here as well. Um, so please go check that out. It was a great conversation. He's doing some great stuff as well out there. Um, and don't forget, there was also a Daga.Garden to catch everything else. And again, I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, Mr. Trees. Thank you, Jimmy, too, for being here for our awesome show. And don't forget to follow, like, and check out all the moderators as you can. I'm going to close out the show and say bye on the YouTube side. Um, but thanks again, everybody. And looking forward to seeing you next week as we talk about bugs, 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 and prepping for the summer season with our expert, uh, Ro uh, Claude Claude Robert about uh, from Anisis Bioprotect. So uh, tune in next week for that awesome episode. I'm going to do the whole in the room. Look. I like this, remove this, uh, brand this, take this off. So you can see a hollow outline of me. Can you hear me? General audio. Yes, you can hear me not super great so we're going to do this one quick little thing to make it super great to make it oh so much better pc loaded give me one minute here for the mix-up mic, and you now have the ASMR version of London Nero. Now, I just wanted to say we had an awesome day today on the Dank Hour, as well as an awesome evening last, uh, as well as an awesome morning this morning with Jordan River from Growcast Podcast. I have a lot of fun stuff coming up in the next little while, so don't miss out on any of that. Make sure to check out that other show as well. Um, next week... Uh, for cannabis for breakfast, I believe we have this pot squatch visiting again. So those that enjoyed that beautiful human being, be back next week for that one. And before you go, make sure to check out Daga.Garden, Daga.Academy, as well as all the other cool people. And there's one last bean we need to touch on because it is Tuesday cannabis for breakfast and all of these amazing items are done for the day. Tomorrow we have... Growing with Marco at 1 p.m. So don't miss out on that. Um, I, I, I frankly love their goddamn show. It, it is absolutely brilliant, and they really kill it. Uh, they really do a really good job. Brian and Lightning is again on on Thursday at 10 a.m., as they are every Thursday. Don't miss on the Joda Herb show on Thursday night at, well, at 6 p.m. Following that, you have Saturday's Mental Breakdown with uh, Chad Westport. Hopefully that's going well. And then next week we have a regular round of shows. But don't forget, you're going to see regularly 
here and there. It's a little hard because they don't they don't quite put it on the schedule, so I can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen. But if you are part of the community and you love growing and you love being part of this community, I advise you to go check out Guerrero Go Show. They are regularly playing throughout the day. He's probably one of the most active streamers on this channel. So if you haven't already, make sure to go him uh, go give him a watch and let him know, let us know what you think about all the awesome programming going on here, including our channel and everything else going on, because we are doing it for you. Not for me, not for anybody else, but for you, the viewer. So looking forward to seeing you all next week. And actually, I'll see you on Thursday, because we got Joe to, grow, Joe to Herbs, Grow and Tell. Anyways, I'm going to end the broadcast and let you all enjoy 